Hello, nerds! This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby! I'm Liv. There's no one else talking to you ever in these episodes, and yet I still always say my name because just in case, you know, I'm Liv. And I am here with a special reading episode specifically to accompany next week's episode, which is a special deep dive into all things Apollo. It's been a while since I did that on any specific god where I just kind of gave you everything, stories, facts, all there is to do about a singular god. And Apollo seems to be the right one. There's a lot there. Anyway, we're starting with these Homeric hymns to Apollo. There are two, one about Apollo's birth and one about the founding of the oracle there on the side of Mount Parnassus. Anyway, Apollo's a really interesting character who is super, super important. I'm happy that I get to make a special episode all devoted to the ins and outs of that god, Apollo. And that there is this incredible Homeric hymn to Apollo to accompany it. So a reminder about the Homeric hymns, they are pieces of literature from generally the time of Homer. We are not supposed to believe they were written by the same guy because also there really was no same guy that was Homer. It's just from a similar time period, i.e. they are very ancient sourcing when it comes to the understanding of Greek mythology. Uh, Also, they're beautiful and they're some of the most detailed stories we have for some of these gods. And I just love reading them out loud and I'm thrilled that there is a translation that I am allowed to read them out loud. The Homeric hymns are so interesting just because they really give such a beautiful glimpse into that time period and and the way the gods might have been sung about or certainly were sung about by certain people. You can imagine that a poet comes to town singing these hymns to the gods. (gasps) It's beautiful. And so without any further ado, I give you two Homeric hymns to Apollo to Delian Apollo, and to Pitho Apollo. This is the Homeric Hymn to Delian Apollo, translated by Hugh Evelyn White. I will remember and not be unmindful of Apollo who shoots afar. As he goes through the house of Zeus, the gods tremble before him, and all spring up from their seats when he draws near as he bends his bright bow. But Leto alone stays by the side of Zeus, who delights in thunder, and then she unstrings his bow and closes his quiver, and takes his archery from his strong shoulders in her hands, and hangs them on a golden peg against a pillar of his father's house. Then she leads him to a seat, and makes him sit, and the father gives him nectar in a golden cup, welcoming his dear son while the other gods make him sit down there, and queenly Leto rejoices, because she bore a mighty son and an archer. Rejoice, blessed Leto, for you bear glorious children, the lord Apollo and Artemis who delights in arrows, her in Ortigia, and him in rocky Delos, as you rested against the great mass of the Kynthian hill hard by a palm tree by the streams of Inopus. How then shall I sing of you who in all ways are a worthy theme of song? For everywhere, O Phoebus, the whole range of song is fallen to you, both over the mainland that rears heifers and over the isles, 
All mountain peaks and high headlands of lofty hills and rivers flowing out to the deep, and beaches sloping seawards and havens of the sea are your delight. Shall I sing how at the first Lido bear you to the, be the joy of men, as she rested against Mount Kynthus in that rocky isle in sea-girt Delos? while on the other hand a dark wave rolled landwards, driven by shrill winds, whence arising you rule over all mortal men? Among those who are in Crete, and in the township of Athens, and in the isle of Aegina and Euboea, famous for ships, in Aegi and Irisii and Peperethus near the sea, in Thracian Athos and Pelion's towering heights, and Thracian Samos and the shady hills of Ida, in Skiros and Phokia and the high hills of Atocony, and fair-lying Imbros and smoldering Lemnos and rich Lesbos, home of Makar, the son of Aeolus, and Chios, brightest of all the isles that lie in the sea, and craggy Mimas and the heights of Coricus and the gleaming Claros and the sheer hill of Asagia and watered Samos, and the steep heights of Mikali in Miletus, and Kos, the city of Meropian men, and steep Knidos, and windy Carpathos, in Naxos, and Paros, and rocky Rhenea, so far roamed Lido in travail with the god who shoots afar, to see if any land would be willing to make a dwelling for her son." but they greatly trembled and feared, and none, not even the richest of them, dared receive Phoebus, until queenly Leto set foot on Delos and uttered winged words and asked her, Delos, if you would be willing to be the abode of my son Phoebus Apollo and make him a rich temple, for no other will touch you, as you will find, and I think you will never be rich in oxen and sheep, nor bear vintage, nor yet produce plants abundantly. But if you have the temple of far-shooting Apollo, all men will bring you hecatombs and gather here, and incessant savor of rich sacrifice will always arise, and you will feed those who dwell in you from the hand of strangers, for truly your own soil is not rich. So spoke Leto, and Delos rejoiced and answered and said, Leto, most glorious daughter of great Chius, joyfully would I receive your child, the far-shooting lord, for it is all too true that I am ill-spoken of among men, whereas thus I should become very greatly honored. But this saying I fear, and I will not hide it from you, Leto. They say that Apollo will be one that is very haughty and will greatly lord it among gods and men over the fruitful earth. Therefore I greatly fear in heart and spirit that as soon as he sets the light of the sun he will scorn this island, for truly I have but a hard rocky soil, and overturn me and thrust me down with his feet in the depths of the sea. Then will the great ocean wash deep above my head forever, and he will go to another land such as will please him, there to make his temple and wooded groves." So many-footed creatures of the sea will make their lairs in me, and black seals their dwellings undisturbed, because I lack people. Yet if you will but dare to swear a great oath, goddess, that here first he will build a glorious temple to be an oracle for men, then let him afterwards make temples and wooded groves amongst all men, for surely he will be greatly renowned." So said Delos, and Leto swore the great oath of the gods. Now hear this, earth and wide heaven above, and dropping water of sticks. This is the strongest and most awful oath for the blessed gods. Surely Phoebus shall have here his fragrant altar and precinct, and you he shall honor above all. Now, when Leto had sworn and ended her oath, Delos was very glad at the birth of the far-shooting lord, but Leto was racked for nine days and nine nights with pangs beyond want. And there were with her all the chiefest of the goddesses, Dion and Rhea and Incnaia and Themis and loud-moaning Amphitrite and the other deathless goddesses save white-armed Hera who sat in the halls of cloud-gathering Zeus. 
Only Ilithia, goddess of sore travail, had not heard Leto's trouble, for she sat on the top of Olympus beneath golden clouds by white-armed Hera's contriving, who kept her close through envy, because Leto with the lovely tresses was soon to bear a son faultless and strong. But the goddess sent out Iris from the well-set isle to bring Ilithia, promising her a great necklace strung with golden threads, nine cubits long. And they bade Iris call her aside from white-armed Hera, lest she might afterwards turn her from coming with words. When swift Iris, fleet of foot as the wind, had heard all this, she set to run. And quickly finishing all the distance she came to the home of the gods, sheer Olympus, and forthwith called Ilithia out from the hall to the door and spoke winged words to her, telling her all as the goddesses who dwell in Olympus had bidden her. So she moved the heart of Ilithia in her dear breast, and they went their way like shy wild doves in their going. And as soon as Ilithia, the goddess of childbirth, set foot on Delos, the pains of birth seized Leto, and she longed to bring forth. So she cast her arms about a palm tree and kneeled on the soft meadow while the earth laughed for joy beneath. Then the child leaped forth to the light, and all the goddesses washed you purely and cleanly with sweet water and swathed you in a white garment of fine texture, new woven, and fastened a golden band about you. Now Leto did not give Apollo, bearer of the golden blade, her breast, but Themis duly poured nectar and ambrosia with her divine hands, and Leto was glad, because she had borne a strong son and an archer. But as soon as you had tasted that divine heavenly food, O Phoebus, you could no longer then be held by golden cords, nor confined with bands, but all their ends were undone. Forthwith, Phoebus Apollo spoke out among the deathless goddesses. The lyre and the curved bow shall ever be dear to me, and I will declare to men the unfailing will of Zeus. So said Phoebus, the long-haired god who shoots afar and began to walk upon the wide-pathed earth. And all the goddesses were amazed at him. Then, with gold, all Delos was laden, beholding the child of Zeus and Leto for joy, because the god chose her above the islands and shore to make his dwelling in her. And she loved him and yet more in her heart, and blossomed as does a mountain top with woodland flowers. And you, O Lord Apollo, god of the silver bow, shooting afar, now walked on craggy Kynthus, and now kept wandering about the island and the people in them. Many are your temples and wooded groves, and all peaks and towering bluffs of lofty mountains and rivers flowing to the sea are dear to you, Phoebus, yet in Delos do you most delight your heart. For there the long-robed Ionians gather in your honor with their children and shy wives. Mindful, they delight you with boxing and dancing and song, so often as they hold their gathering. A man would say that they were deathless and unaging if he should then come upon the Ionians so met together, for he would see the graces of them all and would be pleased in heart gazing at the men and well-girded women with their swift ships and great wealth, And there is this great wonder besides, and its renown shall never perish. The girls of Delos, handmaidens of the far shooter, for when they have praised Apollo first, and also Leto and Artemis who delights in arrows, they sing a strain telling of men and women of past days, and charm the tribes of men. And they can imitate the tongues of all men and their clattering speech. Each would say that he himself were singing, so close to truth is their sweet song. And now may Apollo be favorable, and Artemis, and farewell all you maidens. Remember me, and after times, whenever any one of men on earth, a stranger who has seen and suffered much, comes here and asks of you, Whom, think you, girls, is the sweetest singer that comes here, and in whom do you most delight? Then answer each and all with one voice, He is a blind man and dwells in rocky Chios, his lays are ever more supreme. As for me, I will carry your renown as far as I roam over the earth to the well-placed this thing is true, and I will never cease to praise far-shooting Apollo, god of the silver bow, whom rich-haired Leto bear.
This is the Homeric hymn to Pythian Apollo, translated by Hugh Evelyn White. O Lord, Lycia is yours, and lovely Meonia, and Miletus, charming city by the sea, but over wave-girt Delos you greatly reign your own self. Leto's all-glorious son goes to rocky Pitho, playing upon his hollow lyre, clad in divine, perfumed garments, and at the touch of the golden key his lyre sings sweet. Thence, swift as thought, he speeds from earth to Olympus, to the house of Zeus, to join the gathering of the other gods. Then straightway the undying gods think only of the lyre and song and all the muses together, voice sweetly answering voice, him the unending gifts the gods enjoy and the sufferings of men, all that they endure at the hands of the deathless gods, and how they live witless and helpless and cannot find healing for death or defense against old age. Meanwhile, the rich tressed graces and cheerful seasons dance with Harmonia and Hebe and Aphrodite, daughter of Zeus, holding each other by the wrist, and among them sings one not mean nor puny but tall to look upon an enviable and mean Artemis, who delights in arrows, sister of Apollo. Among them sport Ares and the keen-eyed slayer of Argus, while Apollo plays his lyre, stepping high and featly, and a radiance shines around him, the gleaming of his feet and close-woven vest. And they, even gold-tressed Leto and wise Zeus, rejoice in their great hearts as they watch their dear son playing among the undying gods. How then shall I sing of you, though in all ways you are a worthy theme for song? Shall I sing of you as wooer and in the fields of love, how you went wooing the daughter of Azan along with the godlike Iscus, the son of well-horsed Alatius, or with Forbas sprung from Triops, or with Eruthius, or with Leucippus and the wife of Leucippus? You on foot, he with his chariot, yet he fell not short of Triops. Or shall I sing how at the first you went about the earth seeking a place of oracle for men, O oh, far-shooting Apollo? To Pyrea first you went from Olympus and passed by Sandy Lectus and Aeneni and through the land of the Peribi. Soon you came to Iolcus and set foot on Canaeum and Euboea, famed for ships. You stood at the Lelantine plain, and but it pleased not your heart to make a temple there and wooded groves. From there you crossed the Euripus far-shooting Apollo and went up the green holy hills, going on to Michalessus and grassy-bedded to Messus, and so came to the wood-clad abode of Thebes, for as yet no men lived in holy Thebes, nor were there tracks or ways about Thebes' wheat-bearing plain as yet. And further still you went, O oh, far-shooting Apollo, and came to Onchestus, Poseidon's bright grove. There the new-broken colt, distressed with drawing the trim chariot, gets spirit again, and the skilled driver springs from his car and goes on his way. Then the horses for a while rattle the empty car, being rid of guidance, and if they break the chariot in the woody grove, men look after the horses, but tilt the chariot and leave it there. For this was the right from the very first. And the drivers pray to the lord of the shrine, but the chariot falls to the lot of the god. Further yet you went, O oh, far-shooting Apollo, and reached next Caphysis' sweet stream, which pours forth its sweet-flowing water from Lilia. And crossing over it, O oh, worker from afar, you passed many-towered Ocalia and reached grassy Haliartus. Then you went towards Telfusa, and there the pleasant place seemed fit for making a temple and wooded grove. You came very near and spoke to her. Telfusa, here I am minded to make a glorious temple, an oracle for men, and hither they will always bring perfect hecatombs, both those who live in rich Peloponnesus and those of Europe and all the wave-washed isles coming to seek oracles." and I will deliver to them all counsel that cannot fail, giving answer in my rich temple. So said Phoebus Apollo, and laid out all the foundations throughout, wide and very long. 
But when Telfusa saw this, she was angry in heart and spoke, saying, Lord Phoebus, worker from afar, I will speak a word of counsel to your heart, since you are minded to make here a glorious temple to be an oracle for men who will always bring hither perfect hecatombs for you. Yet I will speak out, and do you lay up my words in your heart. The trampling of swift horses and the sound of mules watering at my sacred springs will always irk you, and men will like better to gaze at the well-made chariots and stamping swift-footed horses than at your great temple and the many treasures that are within. But if you'll be moved by me, for you, Lord, are stronger and mightier than I, and your strength is very great, build at Crissa, below the glades of Parnassus, There no bright chariot will clash, and there will be no noise of swift-footed horses near your well-built altar. But so the glorious tribes of men will bring you gifts to the Epion, and you will receive with delight rich sacrifices from the people dwelling round about. So said Telfusa that she alone, and not the far-shooter, should have renown there, and she persuaded the far-shooter." Further yet you went, far-shooting Apollo, until you came to the town of the presumptuous Phlegii, who dwell on this earth in a lovely glade near the Caphysian lake, caring not for Zeus. And thence you went speeding swiftly to the mountain ridge, and came to Crissa beneath snowy Parnassus, a foothill turned towards the west, a cliff hangs over it from above, and a hollow, rugged glade runs under. There the lord Phoebus Apollo resolved to make his lovely temple, and thus he said, In this place I am minded to build a glorious temple to be an oracle for men, and here they will always bring perfect hecatombs, both they who dwell in rich Peloponnesus and the men of Europe and from all the wave-washed isles coming to question me, and I will deliver to them all counsel that cannot fail answering them in my rich temple. When he had said this, Phoebus Apollo laid out all the foundations throughout, wide and very long, and upon these the sons of Erginus, Trophonius, and Agamedes, dear to the deathless gods, laid a footing of stone. And the countless tribes of men built the whole temple of wrought stones to be sung of forever. But nearby was a sweet flowing spring, and there with his strong bow the lord, the son of Zeus, killed the bloated great she-dragon, a fierce monster wont to do great mischief to men upon earth, to men themselves and to their thin-shanked sheep, for she was a very bloody plague. She it was who once received from gold-throned Hera, brought up fell, cruel Typhon to be a plague to men. Once on a time Hera bare him because she was angry with father Zeus, when the son of Kronos bare all-glorious Athena in his head. Thereupon queenly Hera was angry, and spoke thus among the assembled gods. Hear from me, all gods and goddesses, how cloud-gathering Zeus begins to dishonor me wantonly, when he has made me his true-hearted wife. See now, apart from me, he has given birth to bright-eyed Athena, who is foremost among all the blessed gods. But my son Hephaestus, whom I bear weakly among all the blessed gods, and shriveled a foot, a shame and disgrace to me in heaven, whom I myself took in my hands and cast out, so that he fell in the great sea. But silver-shod Thetis, the daughter of Nereus, took and cared for him with her sisters. Would that she had done other service to the blessed gods. O wicked one and crafty, what else will you now devise? How dared you by yourself give birth to bright-eyed Athena? Would not I have borne you a child, I, who was at least called your wife among the undying gods, who hold wide heaven, Beware now, lest I devise some evil thing for you hereafter. Yes, now I will contrive that a son be born to me, be born to me to be foremost among the undying gods, and that without casting shame on the holy bond of wedlock between you and me. And I will not come to your bed, but will consort with the blessed gods far from you." When she had so spoken, she went apart from the gods, being very angry. 
Then straightway large-eyed queenly Hera prayed, striking the ground flatwise with her hand and speaking thus. Here now, I pray, earth and wide heaven above, and you, titan gods, who dwell beneath the earth about great Tartarus, and from whom are sprung both gods and men, hearken you now to me, one and all, and grant that I may bear a child apart from Zeus, no whit lesser than him in strength. Nay, let him be as much stronger than Zeus as all, seeing Zeus then Kronos. Thus she cried and lashed the earth with her strong hand. Then the life-giving earth was moved, and when Hera saw it, she was glad in heart, for she thought her prayer would be fulfilled. And thereafter she never came to the bed of wise Zeus for a full year, not to sit in her carved chair as aforetime to plan wise counsel for him, but stayed in her temples where many pray, and delighted in her offerings, large-eyed queenly Hera. But when the months and days were fulfilled, and the seasons duly came on as the earth moved round, she bare one neither like gods nor mortal men, fell, cruel Typhion, to be a plague to men. Straightway large-eyed queenly Hera took him, and bringing one evil thing to another such, gave him to the dragoness, and she received him. And this Typhion used to work great mischief among the famous tribes of men. Whosoever met the dragoness, the day of doom would sweep him away, until the Lord Apollo, who deals death from afar, shot a strong arrow at her. Then she, rent with bitter pangs, lay, drawing great gasps of breath and rolling about that place, an awful noise swelled up unspeakable as she writhed continually this way and that amid the wood, and so she left her life, breathing it out forth in blood. Then Phoebus Apollo boasted over her, now wrought here upon the soil that feeds men, you at least shall live no more to be a fell bane to men who eat the fruit of the all-nourishing earth, and who will bring hither perfect hecatombs. Against the cruel death neither Typhaeus shall avail you, nor ill-famed Chimera, but here shall the earth and shining Hyperion make you rot. Thus, said Phoebus, exulting over her, and darkness covered her eyes, and the holy strength of Helios made her rot away there. Wherefore the place is now called Pitho, and men call the Lord Apollo by another name, Pythian, because on that spot the power of piercing Helios made the monster rot away. Then Phoebus Apollo saw that the sweet flowing spring had beguiled him, and he started out in anger against Telfusa, and soon coming to her, he stood close by her and spoke. Telfusa, you were not after all to keep to yourself this lovely place by deceiving my mind, and pour forth your clear flowing water. Here my renown shall also be, and not yours alone. Thus spoke the lord, far-working Apollo, and pushed over upon her a crag with a shower of rocks, hiding her streams, and he made himself an altar in a wooded grove very near the clear-flowing stream. In that place all men pray to the great one by the name Telfusian, because he humbled the stream of holy Telfusa. Then Phoebus Apollo pondered in his heart what men he should bring in with his ministers in sacrifice and to serve him in rocky pitho. And while he considered this, he became aware of a swift ship upon the wine-like sea in which were many men and goodly Cretans from Knossos, the city of Minos, they who do sacrifice to the prince and announce his decrees. Whatsoever Phoebus Apollo, bearer of the golden blade, speaks in answer from his laurel tree below the dells of Parnassus, these men were sailing in their black ship, for traffic and for profit to sandy Pelos and to the men of Pelos. But Phoebus Apollo met them. In the open sea he sprang upon their swift ship like a dolphin in shape, and lay there, a great and awesome monster, and none of them gave heed so as to understand, but they sought to cast the dolphin overboard. But he kept shaking the black ship every way and made the timbers quiver. So they sat silent in their craft for fear and did not loose the sheets throughout the black hollow ship, nor lowered the sail of their dark, proud vessel. But as they had set it first of all with oxide ropes, so they kept sailing on. For a rushing south wind hurried on the swift ship from behind. 
First, they passed Malia, and then along the Laconian coast, they came to Tinarum, sea-garlanded town and country of Helios who gladdens men, where the thick-fleeced sheep of the Lord Helios feed continually and occupy a gladsome country. There they wished to put their ship to shore and land and comprehend the great marvel and see with their eyes whether the monster would remain upon the deck of the hollow ship or spring back into the briny deep where fishes shoal. But the well-built ship would not obey the helm, but went on its way all along Peloponnesus, and the lord, far-working Apollo, guided it easily with the breath of the breeze. So the ship ran on its course and came to Arena, and lovely Argaphia and Threon, the ford of Alpheus, and well-placed Epi and Sandy Pelos, and the men of Pelos, past Cruni it went, and Calchas, and past Dime and fair Elis, where the Epi rule. And at the time when she was making for Phiri, exulting in the breeze from Zeus, there appeared to them below the clouds the steep mountain of Ithaca, and Dilichium and Same, and wooded Zacynthus. But when they were passed by all the coast of Peloponnesus, then towards Crissa the vast gulf began to heave in sight, which through all its length cuts off the rich isle of Pelops. There came on them a strong, clear west wind by ordinance of Zeus, and blew from heaven vehemently, that with all speed the ship might finish coursing over the briny water of the sea. So they began again to voyage back towards the dawn and the sun, and the lord Apollo, son of Zeus, led them on until they reached far-seen Crissa, land of vines, and into haven there the sea-coursing ship grounded on the sands. Then, like a star at noonday, the lord, far-working Apollo, leaped from the ship, flashes of fire flew from him thick, and their brightness reached to heaven. He entered into his shrine between priceless tripods, and there made a flame to flare up bright, showing forth the splendor of his shafts, so that their radiance filled all Crissa, and the wives and well-girded daughters of the Crissians raised a cry at that outburst of Phoebus, for he cast great fear upon them all. From his shrine he sprang forth again, swift as thought, to speed again to the ship, bearing the form of a man, brisk and sturdy, in the prime of his youth, while his broad shoulders were covered with his hair, and he spoke to the Cretans, uttering winged words. "'Strangers, who are you? Whence come you sailing along the paths of the sea? Are you for traffic, or do you wander at random over the sea as pirates do, who put their own lives to hazard and bring mischief to men of foreign parts as they roam? Why rest you so, and are afraid, and do not go ashore, nor stow the gear of your black ship?' For that is the custom of men who live by bread. Whenever they come to land in their dark ships from the main spent with toil, at once desire for sweet food catches them about the heart. So speaking, he put courage in their hearts, and the master of the Cretans answered him and said, Stranger, though you are nothing like mortal men in shape or stature, but are as the deathless gods, hail all and happiness to you, and may the gods give you good. Now tell me truly that I may surely know it, What country is this, and what land, and what men live herein? As for us, with thoughts set on other words, we were sailing over the great sea to Pelos from Crete, for from there we declare that we are sprung, but now are come on shipboard to this place by no means willingly, another way and other paths, and gladly would we return, but one of the deathless gods brought us here against our will." Then far-working Apollo answered them and said, Strangers who once dwelt about wooded Knossos, but now shall return no more each to his loved city and fair house and dear wife, here shall you keep my rich temple that is honored by many men. I am the son of Zeus, Apollo is my name, but you I brought here over the wide gulf of the sea, meaning you no hurt. Nay, here you shall keep my rich temple that is greatly honored among men, and you shall know the plans of the deathless gods, and by their will you shall be honored continually for all time. 
And now come, make haste and do as I say. First loose the sheets and lower the sail, and then draw the swift ship up upon the land. Take out your goods and the gear of the straight ship, and make an altar upon the beach of the sea. Light fire upon it, and make an offering of white meal. Next, stand side by side around the altar and pray, and inasmuch as the first on the hazy sea, see, I sprang upon the swift ship in the form of a dolphin. Pray to me as Apollo Delphinius. Also, the altar itself shall be called Delphinius, and overlooking forever. Afterwards, sup beside your dark ship and pour an offering to the blessed gods who dwell on Olympus. But when you have put away craving for sweet food, come with me singing the hymn until you come to the place where you shall keep my rich temple. So said Apollo, and they readily hearkened to him and obeyed him. First they unfastened the sheets and let down the sail and lowered the mast by the four stays upon the mast rest. Then, landing upon the beach of the sea, They hauled up the ship from the water to dry land and fixed long stays under it. Also they made an altar upon the beach of the sea, and when they had it lit a fire, made an offering of white meal, and prayed standing around the altar as Apollo had bidden them. Then they took their meal by the swift black ship and poured an offering to the blessed gods who dwell on Olympus. And when they had put away craving for drink and food, they started out with the Lord Apollo, the son of Zeus, to lead them, holding a lyre in his hands and playing sweetly as he stepped high and featly. So the Cretans followed him to Pitho, marching in time as they chanted Lepian after the manner of the Cretan Pian singers, and of those in whose hearts the heavenly muse has put sweet-voiced song. With tireless feet they approached the ridge and straightway came to Parnassus and the lovely place where they were to dwell, honored by many men. There Apollo brought them and showed them his most holy sanctuary and rich temple. But their spirit was stirred in their dear breasts, and the master of the Cretans asked him, saying, Lord, since you have brought us here from our dear ones and our fatherland, for so it seemed good to your heart, tell us now how we shall live— that we would know of you. This land is not to be desired either for vineyards or for pastures, so that we can live well thereon and also minister to men. Then Apollo, the son of Zeus, smiled upon them and said, Foolish mortals and poor drudges are you, that you seek cares and hard toils and straits. Easily will I tell you a word and set it in your hearts, Though each one of you with knife in hand should slaughter sheep continually, yet would you have always abundant in store, even all that the glorious tribes of men bring here for me. But guard you my temple and receive the tribes of men that gather to this place, and especially show mortal men my will, and do you keep righteousness in your heart. But if any shall be disobedient and pay no heed to my warning, or if there shall be any idle word or deed and outrage as is common among mortal men, then other men shall be your masters and with a strong hand shall make you subject forever. All has been told you. Do you keep it in your heart? And so farewell, son of Zeus and Leto, but I will remember you and another him also. Oh, nerds, I really love reading this stuff. The Homeric hymns are so fascinating. There are not a lot of them that are this long that can make for full episodes, unfortunately, but I'm thrilled to be able to read these ones to you. They're both just so fascinating in their language and everything and and that origin of, of Delphi and through Apollo and just kidnapping people from another island and forcing them to go help you. Great guy. Totally nice to mortals. Anyway, these are just, they're honestly so fun. Um, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I think it's a perfect accompaniment to a special episode on Apollo. It's been a while since I did an episode devoted specifically just to one god and all of his bullshit, so it seemed only right. Next week, another incredible conversation with a woman who is particularly, I would say, uh, appreciated in Apollo's eyes for certain musical talents. 
Thank you all so much for listening. You are the absolute best. I am Liv and I love this shit.